there's a beautiful quotation by, by Russell, what, uh, what, what he thinks, um, but before he wrote his book, his standard textbook now in AI, you see, why he moved from Oxford and these foundational things to AI, and that motivated us at the time. But then over the next 20 or 30 years, AI became split up more and more and became more and more technical, and in fact very, very technical in this field, with his background in logic and mathematics. It became very technical indeed. And this general dream of building a system that can be like us, more or less, technically, not quite like us, that was completely lost. And many of the old chaps now who were there around in the early days, they all say, look, come back to the roots. Look at the, at the general issue that, that was driven, driving us at the time. For well, almost all, Newell gave a paper before he died. Uh, Simon always emphasized that we have become too technical and too involved in our little issues. We have to come back to the general issue. Niels Nielsen had a, has recent, recently written a paper again. They all see, well, we are sort of split up and we don't have the dream anymore. And that's why I was fascinated, although I was in a different uh, research community, I was always fascinated by this community, artificial general intelligence. That's what drove us originally. And although this subject is, as, it, as we were at the time, not very technical, not very advanced, most people sort of smile about it a little bit and say, oh, these are just the dreamers. But we were dreamers at the time, 20 or 30 years ago, well, 40 years ago in my time, almost. <laughs> I don't know, I have to calculate it again. <laughs> I'm 70 now, actually, so it's, I have quite some time. Um, anyway, you see, so that, that, and that really drove me. I, I had a choice between robotics and automated theorem proof. Both were present at Essex University where I obtained my PhD. And for, well, robotics was in Edinburgh. I wanted to, I had a girlfriend in Essex. I wanted to stay at Essex. And my background was in mathematics anyway. But you see, when we built the first theorem proving systems and then continued this for more than 30 years now, 40 years almost, um, the idea was to build one system that was an AI you know, in mathematics. And it doesn't really matter that much for the principles, whether you build it in mathematics or whether you build it in robotics. And that's why I'm, con I'm concentrating here for technical reasons on mathematics. But I think the general ideas and the, the things behind, the principles behind, they apply to other areas as well. Christian always criticized me. I was too technical in my first uh, slides, and I've, so I've changed it a little bit. Okay, all right, so having said so much, Consider a general artificial mathematical assistant, a human assistant, what does he do? Well, this is a very far cry what you would expect from, I'm a professor, I have all my assistants. I talk to them, they are general intelligence. Yeah, I give the sort of general direction, but the, the actual work is done by them, usually. Okay? And particularly when we work on something concrete, yes, they do the work, next day we meet and so on. Now look at what computer-supported mathematics is doing these days. After more than 50 years, they are still building automated theorem provers that can do nothing else but search these huge search spaces, just like traditional chess. And that is very, very frustrating. And for that and other reasons, we split off from the usual community, which is represented in K, and started a revolution, as we saw. Now you start the revolution, you are the next generation. And that was Calculemos, um, all these small workshops around K. They were saying, look, with a traditional kind of theorem problem, you will never get there. This is such a far cry from everything. It's beautiful. And the question is, why is it still there? And I'll come to that in a minute. But let's look first at what, what do I expect from a, from a general system that helps me in doing mathematics? or any, any other activity of that kind. Well, it has to do text processing. No theorem proving system can do that, but this is absolutely essential. You write your paper and you talk to him and so on, and make it happen. You want to have uh, access to the knowledge base of that assistant, and these days the assistant has access to all these beautiful databases in mathematics. In mathematics, I think every two seconds a paper is published. There are millions of papers, um, there are competitions how to find a paper, the most recent paper, and these days these competitions are no longer done by humans. Twenty or thirty years in my field, 
I ran against my assistants, who knows that paper and who knows it first. And then I was beaten at one, I mean, 10, 15 years ago. Of course, I was beaten by machines. They just, and you know about Google Science and so on. All right? But you see, finding something there doesn't mean finding as with Google. Google doesn't help you much in finding the appropriate theorem. You want to need the semantics. It just looks for the syntax of the theory. When I talk to my assistant, um, he understands what I'm looking for. So if it is formulated this way or that way, uh, that doesn't matter. Okay? With my assistant, I'm always in a particular theory context. When I talk to him and I try to retrieve something or talk about this, we are in a specific context. But the theorem prover isn't the traditional theorem prover. It's always there and it's always the same. Completely wrong, of course. It will never get anywhere. And then you have all these nice tools and support tools. Uh, you mentioned some of them. Um, you need in this context, but in any other context, you need the other tools. They compute something specific. The robot computes something, how to do the arm. Uh, well, we compute computer algebra systems and so on, with computer algebra systems and so on. Okay? But apart from these specific computations down here, which you need in any field, and you will always have these additional tools to rely on to do something for you, um, in this area, and I believe in almost any other area, the core is the reasoning part. And that is what I like to concentrate on. Now, this is an old area. In fact, AI started with it. In 1954, the first theorem ever was proven by a machine, which is um, this mind-bogging theorem that the sum of two even numbers is, again, even. And there was a long time of race in my field. Um, who, who had the first theorem ever proved by a machine? And well, in fact, Bill Muddy Davis is the winner right now. And in 1956, you, well, you all know that the Dartmouth Conference, that is when the name artificial intelligence was coined. And the first presenters there, among many others, were Alan Newell and Herb Simon, who presented a little theorem prover, the logic theorist, uh, that proved theorems, I think, 100 or 200 uh, little theorems from the Principia Mathematica. Okay? Just, just to clarify one thing, I mean, when you say proved by computer, you mean without any human intervention? Right. Otherwise, it's not the first. Okay. I'm sure there, there are others that did other things earlier than that. that that's right. So the idea, of, particularly in those days, I have a quotation in the middle, look ma, no hands. The computer does it, we don't interfere. Okay? That was the, the dominating paradigm at the time in AI. Okay, and out of this, really, in the next 55 years, two schools, two main, but there are many schools that split their workshops these days, there are about 100 automated reasoning workshops and conferences and so on. But basically there are two schools. One tries to simulate what humans do, and the other say, look, we have machines, I don't care what humans do, I use the power of a machine. Those, and this is again general in AI anywhere. Look at chess. Look at any, any area in AI. You have these two schools always. And usually they fight each other. Now, this is 55 years since. And what happens in those 50 years? Well, first there is a classical automated theorem program. I believe everybody has had the chance to listen to an AI introductory course. And every AI introductory course at least a resolution principle or something like that. Then there is tactical theorem proving that emerged completely different from Edinburgh and later on in systems like Isabel. They never believed in general AI. They never believed in the intelligence of a machine. They said a machine can check what I do. And tactical theorem proving means um, you do the proof, but you don't write it on a piece of paper, you write it into the machine. And now since it is very tedious to write every single step, you define a tactic. And the tactic is a set, several steps, maybe 10 steps. You put it into a little module and call it a tactic. And so what you tell the computer then is not every single step, but use that tactic, use that tactic. And that way you prove your theorem. But 
Then there are the diehards. They never quite vanish from the scene, from the scene, although they're very small. And, and well, we are all outsiders in, in that respect. The main, the main schools all are in these areas. They still believe, or let's say, they are convinced that none of these methods will ever lead to a general, art, general artificial intelligence, to a general mathematical system. I used to believe that, but I don't want to concentrate too much on, on our personal experience. So they always look at what is, was happening here. And actually, the first renegade then was um, already in the 70s and 80s Woody Bledsoe. He is my hero. When I was young, he was, you know, I was really afraid of him. Um, because this is the classical paradigm we all grew up in, and he became increasingly critical of all this. This is still today's paradigm in automated research. Namely, you have a machine, that the machine is very fast, it's a black box, and all you can do is set the parameters on that machine. You twiddle it with it. Otter is a good example. Uh, a chess playing program, these huge chess playing programs are exactly the same paradigm. You have little heuristic knobs up here and you can set them this way or that way and then you run it. It doesn't prove the theorem and, it's, and what does that mean? It searches a huge search space. When I started, my first theorem prover had a search space of say 100,000 clauses. The system we built after that, the Karlsruhe system, it had about a million. And these very modern systems, our Omega systems and the systems around, they look at billions, billions of clauses. And nobody expected that you can do so much with that. Look at chess. Who would have expected that with this silly paradigm, namely just search through all the possible moves, you would ever beat the grandmaster? Well, it was just it was a bit of luck. It took longer than Simon predicted, but after 40 years they were there and they beat them. Okay? Today we will have a talk on Go. Who, who is that, if I may ask? The, yeah, the next Baum. speaker on Baum? Is yeah, there? I don't think he's arrived yet. Oh, okay. Anyway, you see, it, it was so lucky that they, that they took chess, because with Go it won't work. The search space with Go is so big that you won't get there. And even if, since you can't even get there with, with, with Go, how would you ever get there in something so intellectually demanding as, uh, as automatic theorem proving? Or in general, doing mathematics. One of the collected the brightest minds. Um, it attracted the brightest, mind, brightest minds ever. And how could you expect to win in that way? Okay? So that's what he said. Look, we will never get there. And in fact, what mathematicians did, they tried to conquer these huge search spaces um, by a hell of a lot of extra knowledge they have, and in fact, they don't set blindly search these search spaces at all. So can we do better? Well, looking back at AI, really today's automated reasoning, as Alan Bundy put it once day, automated reasoning today is frozen in the time warp of the 60s and 70s. It's a bit fastidious to say so, but in fact there is an element of truth in it. All these paradigms that changes in, in AI, they never really much affected the field. And the question is, are they just stupid or dumb or why? Well, no, not quite. The answer is that just like in chess, with this enormous machine power, you can really get the hell of a lot. And so all these young Turks that came in and did their PhD again, they improved. And they improved vastly the system. And today, even these classical systems, they have, they have solved open mathematical problems. Um, they're very, very strong, even in comparison to a human mathematician. So why should they give up? But still, the question is, where will it lead in the long run? And I personally, having raced against all the American systems in the 70s and 80s myself with a group, this was the largest group in the world at the time, I burned about five or six million euros alone in those areas, and that in these areas that was a lot at the time. Today it is not a lot. The, the research projects at the DFK run to the tune of 10 million, some are 200 million uh, in size. So this is peanuts in comparison to that. But in those days, we were all outsiders anyway. We were a professor with two or three assistants. 
And we had a group of 10 or 15. Germany was really good at that, very nice to me, frankly. And the, but after 10 years, we said, look, thank you, Mr. President, to give us all the money. We wanted to send the rocket to the moon, but unfortunately, it didn't get there. We, we never got on the moon. And with what we are currently doing, we will never get there anyway. Well, this doesn't, didn't make me many, I didn't get many friends in my field by saying that, and we, we cut it off. And, I mean, a miracle happened. The German Research Foundation, the National Science Foundation, they didn't cut us off, but gave us another 10 years to start an alternative. And the alternative is this. And before I start on the challenges, um, I have to introduce this, because this is really the move away from the mindless search space of these millions and billions of clauses into a meaningful mathematics, into a meaningful mathematics where you have real concepts. And otherwise, we, if, that hadn't, if this leap hadn't happened in the last 10 years or so, or 15 years, then we wouldn't need to discuss it here. You see, with the traditional theorem proving crunching to the bunch of clauses, you, you can't talk about general AI. You can't even give it advice because it's so low in your representation. So there are two ideas. And the, the technical breakthrough was by Ellen Bunny. Uh, namely, it has to be knowledge-based, well, in, in the rest of AI that happened, it happened in 1975. And instead of searching, we want to do planning. The idea being, <clears throat> you see, searching is blind, but planning is goal-directed. You have a goal, that's the, the essential difference. You're driving towards something, and that was every human does. You don't blindly search, so okay. Okay, planning, we all know that, do we? little blocks, world, strips, and what have you, and the goal is to put B on the table, and then you, you do the usual thing, okay? Now that is the paradigm we like to be in. And the essential thing is here, the knowledge for this little robot is captured in these operators. The knowledge is captured in these operators, okay? These operators tell what the robot can do, let me pick up, put down, and so on. Every AI student learns these days. Okay, what could the methods, what could these operators be in mathematics? Well, <clears throat> Alan Bundy's idea in the late 80s was the following. He, he grew in an environment, excuse me, all right? He grew up in an environment of tactics and tactical theorem proving as well as standard theorem proving. So what he proposed is we use a tactic and we put a precondition and a postcondition. We stick that onto that tactic. And then we plan with tactics. We have one tactic, the next tactic, and so on. Okay? And we use a planning algorithm to do that. And that is what um, what is depicted in this here. So we have the precondition and postcondition, and we have this tactic in here. And here's a little example. This example shows an indirect proof, or proof by contradiction. And it's something like this. This is the premise, this is the conclusion, that's a pre- and postcondition in traditional planning. And what it says here, if you want to prove the theorem, negate it. And then from the negated theorem, you derive a contradiction. And because of that contradiction, you say, aha, this is wrong, so the negation again is right, it's true, and then you have the conclusion. So, to give you the flavor, okay? That's the idea. Whatever you have in proving, not knowledge about proving, you put into this kind of uh, schema. And then, <coughs> the uh, proof planning works like this. Here is your initial set of um, goals. Here is your initial set of axioms. Here is the goal, the theorem. And from this you want to get there, you want to show it. Usually you have all these tiny little resolution steps or whatever you have. All right? <laughs> you have all these little resolution steps in between. And this is what we don't want. Now what the system is supposed to do, to plan one method, which is a big chunk, of little steps. This may represent hundreds of logical steps. You, you plan at this level of abstraction towards the goal, and then you instantiate 
the method by these little steps of the resolution. And that again happens by layer by layer until you come down. And in those days when it all started, um, the standard theorem provers with, say, a, capable of searching a million, a few hundred million clauses would end up with a proof no longer than 100 steps. 10, 20 steps is the usual size of the proofs that a technical system like that finds. Okay, yeah, I'm almost done. Um, now with this, you may have 100 steps up here. These days, these planning systems find systems 1,000, 10,000 steps. The Iraq war was one, among other things, because they had these huge planning systems with thousands and thousands, and thousands of steps. Okay, so wouldn't it be nice to plan at that level, and in fact that happened, and then instantiate? Okay, and instantiate again. Um, I'll skip. Oh no, I, I'll go quickly through this little example. It gives you an intuition, and then I'll come to the challenge. Um, this is a, an old time favorite for, of mine. Suppose you want to show if this is a, an equivalence relation, and that is an equivalence relation then the union of these two relations and the inverse is again, and, uh, and the transitive closure, excuse me, is still an, an equivalence relation. Now how do you show that? First, of course in mathematics, well, you look at the definition of, um, of an equivalence relation, which is a relation that has a symmetry, reflexivity, and that is symmetric, reflexive, and transitive, and you show that that holds for this as well. So what they, the, so there is a, a simple method that says if you have to show something like this, then show that this thing is symmetric, reflexive, and so on. And that's exactly what it does. So the instantiation with the first method is something like this. It says that the definition for the reflexive uh, for the equivalence relations, and then it says show that this is sy symmetric. Show that this is transitive, and so on. Okay? And then it grinds on, and it's so easy, any theorem prover can show that right away. But it couldn't maybe show this right away. Okay? And that's the general idea of this theory. And from that you can see the reasoning is happening at a level, no longer the little clauses, but it's happening at a level of human reasoning as well. And that was our main goal, to show a system that would reason at the level a human mathematician would reason and write a proof on that level. Okay? And the paradigm, that is, was the work of my wife, unfortunately she uh, passed away a few months ago from cancer, that was her main contribution. <coughs> Namely, taking <coughs> Woody Blackson's challenges, these are all limit theorems, um, in this class, and you may recall that from if you have a background in mathematics, um, they are considered very simple. That's first term in mathematics, first term mathematics. But no classical system, up until this very day, has chose, has solved any of these proposals, let, except maybe the very simple one. I think this plus lim plus. It, it says if you have a sum of two functions. And then the limit of the first function, the limit of the second function, and the sum of those is again the limit. Okay? This is easy, and this could be done by Otter, I believe, but all the others are still open. Using this approach, not only were all, and this is the, the, the method for, for doing this, so I will skip over this, not only every blood Bledsoe challenge was problem solved. In fact, the whole area of epsilon delta proofs is basically solved these days using this crucial complex estimate um, method as well as maybe a few more dozen. Today maybe there are a hundred little methods around and that is enough to solve the whole area. Any mathematical textbook, any absolute data, they are no longer a challenge. Okay? And the reason being that we have this abstract level and do it on a level any student would do it. Once the proof is there, the proof is represented like this. On the abstract level, here is the plan, and here are the instantiations, and we keep a record of all these, so you can move up and down in this tree. 
Okay? And then from there you can start a verbalization. The top level is then verbalized and in several steps. That's another 10 years of research, not only at our group, but any other group. So finally, and that's the state of the art in this area. Yeah, I'm done. Uh, this is my, my final slide before the challenges come. I have extra time for the challenges? Or? Okay. Um, you see, um, you can traverse the tree of the proof. You can look at the proof as I showed it before in that format, and you have a verbalization of the proof on your screen. Now, and this was the, the general, general introduction to the, to the topic, okay? That's where we are. We have checked that in many areas. We have done, for example, we have a tutor system for mathematics that was used with human uh, students in the first term to see how they prove, and then the system run it, and we show whether they are the same proofs. We had different heuristics done to simulate that and so on. So what we can say now is, today, in 2011, we have systems that reason at this very abstract human level. And they do this very nicely, and in fact, no classical system can even start to, to, to compete. Okay, that, but that's a side way. That's a, my attack on my old friends. I, I, I did, but you are not interested in this kind of nitty gritty fights anyway. Okay? So, what are the challenges? How much time do I have for that? Just to introduce and we discuss about it. One or two minutes. So okay. Yeah. I think there are two main areas. In fact, you can dream even more, and I'd like to, 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 to give more ideas later on if you're, if you're interested in One is that we want to automatically discover mathematical concepts. You see these concepts are represented there, what is a semi-group and so on, within the system and all the other mathematical definitions. <coughs> Um, but they are human generated coming to your introduction they are human generated we have to do it and they are pretty complex now this is a very old idea the AM system that was in the 70s he won the computer and thought award for it for his automatic mathematics system that came in this respect well it was tuned too highly you know, they made these grand claims and then looking at the system he was even accused of dishonesty. And when he finally ended up in prison, I think because of tax fraud or something, nobody really didn't want to know much about it. Until 10 or 20 years later, Alan Bundy took it up again. He had a rational reconstruction of the system, and he had these young students, including Simon Colton, who tried to rebuild it and do it all over again. And his system is called HR, and that is a beautiful system, actually. It does this kind of automatic generation of, of mathematics, of theories. <clears throat> Using an ML representation of the concepts. This is getting a little technical, but I have to just quickly show it to you, otherwise we can't continue the discussion later on. What this is, is an XML this, this representation of one concept, and the concept is that of a monoid. A monoid is a semi-group, and you know what semi-group is, you know, just an associative system, and it has a unit, a one, okay? And it is represented like this. So we have a monoid. Um, a monoid, in fact, is a structure, a mathematical structure. Where what? Well, where you have a unit. And you um, multiply the unit with any element, it gives you the element, okay? Above that, we have some metadata. This is very important, for example, in a teaching context. In the teaching context, it doesn't only show where this concept is generally in the structure of concepts. So you, you have um, what they call these days um, an ontology, and this is somewhere within this ontology. But you also have metadata of students where this applies to who is supposed to learn their first year or ten year, second year or, or things like that. Okay. And this gives additional information in, in, within the format, the details I, that don't matter, about the format, the actual representation in this special system is called OMDOC, and that is the kind of representation it chooses. That is for this kind of workshop not that important, but what I want to stress here is, if you have a decent concept, and if it is decently complex, then you have a complex representation in some format, 
and your system has to generate that. Otherwise, we are just talking blue sky. Well, and how can we do this automatically? Well, and that's part of the discussion, filling in the slots or combination of existing concepts. And I'll elaborate on that later. And the other challenge we were supposed to do after, do too, well, you have all these new concepts, but how do you build a theory? You know, where do the axioms come from? And how is this, this, this field represented? And that's my second.